Our New Testament scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and then verses 36 through 43. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? That's called a dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> but he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and he went into the same house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with the fire, so we will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word and may we put your word into practice each and every day of our lives. Amen. There was a woman who was driving around a hairpin turn on a narrow country road and she swung a bit wide and she forced a man coming in the opposite direction to swerve sharply to avoid collision. To add insult to injury, as the woman passed the man, she rolled down her window, she stuck her head out, and she yelled, pig! Hastily judging her as crass and obnoxious and dangerous, the man shouted back, calling her a maniac. As the man continued on his journey and rounded the next curve, he crashed into the biggest pig you have ever seen. <laughs> Sometimes it's just hard to know someone. A person can come across as aggressive and rude, like the woman in our story, and in actuality they are just trying to help. They are just trying to be kind. In our scripture, Jesus tells us a parable about sowing seed, and what happened to good seed when it was deliberately sabotaged. In verses 36 through 43, Jesus explains his parable. The one who sows the good seed is Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of God. The weeds are the children of the evil one. The enemy that sowed the weeds in the garden is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So now that we have all the parts in place, let's read this scripture again. Jesus nurtured and cultivated his children in the world. When no one was aware, the devil came and put evil ones in with God's children, and then he went away. So when the people started to produce and live good lives, evil ones were among them. Others came to Jesus and said, Master, did you not, good put, did you not put good people on the earth? Where then did these evil ones come from? He answered, the devil has done this. Then do you want us to gather up all that are evil? But he replied, No, for in gathering the evil, you would uproot the righteous along with them. Let both of them grow until the time when God returns. In that time I will tell the angels, collect the evil ones first, 
Bind them in bundles to be burned, but the righteous ones give to me. In this parable of Jesus, we discover that the world is full of good and evil. There are two forces that exist together until the day when God will send in the angels to separate the good, the good seed, from the bad weeds. This is heavy stuff. This passage deals with God's judgment and angels and devils and evil in the world and, and, and making judgments of those people and ending up in the fiery furnace. Does this passage concern you? Do you sometimes feel that you are both the wheat and the weeds? Does the devil and evil people and, and, and bad things around you, does it make you fearful? Well, when I read this passage, I come away with a good feeling. I love this passage because here in this parable, Jesus is laying out certain truths and is giving us practical advice on how to live as children of God. William Barclay says that this parable teaches us several things. First, it teaches us that there is evil in the world waiting to destroy good. It teaches us that sometimes it's hard to distinguish who is of God's kingdom and who is not. And it teaches us not to be so quick to judge and that God alone will discern the good from the bad. So let's look at each one of these three points in turn. First, there is evil in the world waiting to destroy the good. Before we get to that, let's talk about the good. Can you wake up every morning and recognize good things in your life? It's easy to recognize the bad, the negative, the unjust, the unfair, the unrelenting. But if I take a moment, I can think of the goodness in my life. I live in a nice community. I have the freedom with my life to choose, and I have occasions every day to grow. I recognize the gifts and talents God has bestowed on me. I have my faith to see me through tough times. There is technology that makes life easier and more convenient. I have a family and friends that love and support who I am as an individual. I am a child of God, so I am loved, I am forgiven, and I am never Forgotten, And let's not forget the best of all, I am serving the most amazing congregation. In other words, there are lots of reasons and opportunities for me to see good, to be good, and to do good things. And as good as life may be, we all know that evil exists, that bad things happen, that the innocent can be made to suffer. We read in the paper, we see on the news, senseless violence, evil acts, and people who are just plain bad. They abuse, degrade, and tear down the very core of who we are as a people. The bad in this world is intertwined with the good, and try as we might, we just can't get rid of it. There is also in each of us a propensity for those weeds to creep in to our wheat fields. Evil thoughts and deeds can be indirect and they can be subtle. Talitha J. Arnold, one of the contributors to Feasting on the Word, says this, our personal experience of the enemy sowing may be more subtle as in the countless distractions that we let derail us. Emails, phone calls, and endless meetings can make it look as if we are working in the realm of God but they may simply be symptoms of our own divided souls. The enemy uses several avenues of pursuit to implement evil and bad things in our lives. But Jesus helps us. Here in this passage, he is reminding us to be aware, to be ready, to be ever vigilant. When it comes to combating anything that goes against God's love and teaching, we are to not falter, to not give up, to not let our guards down, and to never stop doing good things. Second thing Jesus teaches us is it can be difficult to distinguish who is and who is not part of God's kingdom. A person may appear to be good, but really isn't, and vice versa. Therefore, we must see people for who they truly are. 
That means being willing to give someone the benefit of the doubt, to not judge a book by its cover. And before we make a decision about another person, we should walk a mile in their shoes. This was one of Jesus' great gifts. He had that innate, innate ability to see everyone for who they really were. Look at the men that he chose to be his disciples. The men that would carry out his message. The men that would form Christianity out into the world. There was Peter who typically spoke first and thought later. He was brash and he was aggressive and he was headstrong. James and John, the two brothers, were always fighting and competing for them to be the, in the highest position and to sit at Jesus' side. We had Matthew the tax collector, a man who was hated and feared and disturbed by everybody. Simon the zealot, the instigator, the man who was anti-government, anti-establishment, the man who in normal circumstances would never, ever, ever be anywhere close to a tax collector. We have Nathaniel who had that preconceived notion about Jesus, asking if anything good ever comes out of Nazareth. And of course, Thomas, whose natural tendency was to doubt and require an offer of proof for everything he saw. Jesus, when deciding those who would be his 12, did not pick men based on their popularity or their classifications or how they were perceived by others. He selected men based on what was in their hearts and what they were capable of becoming. Jesus commands us to do the same. We should be treating others based on what we know, not on what we have heard. We should be treating others based on what is in our heart and mind and not based on rumors and opinions. We should be treating others with dignity and respect instead of jumping to conclusions. In short, we should be treating each other so that we are always bringing out the best in other people. Now finally, this parable teaches us not to be so quick to judge and that God alone will discern what is good and what is bad. It is not our responsibility to make judgments against other people. That is something that God will sort through. God's judgment will come. God sees the whole of our life and knows how honorably or dishonorably we are living it. And according to scripture, at the day of harvest, God will separate the wheat from the weeds. The weeds will be bundled and burned and the wheat will be gathered and stored in God's barn. So the question is, is why doesn't God just get rid of the bad people and the bad things that happen? In verse 29, Jesus says, in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. So let's suppose that God decides tomorrow that he will take all the evil away from this world and he will just leave the good. What would happen? Well, first of all, for me personally, if God did separate all the good from the bad, I'm not sure if I would be wheat or if I would be weeds. Now, I am doing my very best every day as a child of God, but the reason I don't know which I would be is because I'm a work in progress. And I need every minute and every chance to do the best that I can. In other words, God is not finished with me. I'm not ready to be picked. But second, if God was to come here tomorrow and take away all the evil and all the bad things in our life, then the questions become, how do we grow? How do we wrestle with temptations? How do we learn from our failures? How are we challenged? How do we triumph? How do we flourish? How would we know that we are living good lives if there was nothing to keep us in check? I'm certainly not advocating or inviting evil and bad things to take place. Evil, the enemy, the devil, it causes harm, it causes pain, it causes suffering. It has consequences. It affects how we move forward and it changes our lives in profound ways. And we all wish that evil wasn't part of our existence, and it may be difficult to understand why the bad is woven into the good. But the takeaway here is for us to focus on the good. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is good. Living a life of service is good. Loving, trusting, and believing in people is good. 
Jesus as a living presence in our lives is good. Never being alone, never being abandoned, never having to worry if God will be there. Focus on the good. Now, once there were two students, I'll go this way, and these two students met in organic chemistry in college. And they, were, they became pretty good friends while they were in college. They would study together. They would pass note cards and flashcards. They were lab partners. They prepared for things in this class together. And as this class was nearing the end of the term, these two students were going into the final exam with a good, solid A. And this became their problem. The night before exam, they were invited to a huge off-campus party. And they were in college, so who could resist that? Besides, they knew this stuff, they didn't need to study. They decided they would go to the party instead. So they went to the party. The boys had a great time. The boys stayed a long time at the party. The boys stumbled home in the wee hours of the night or the wee hours of the morning, however you want to look at it. The boys overslept and missed their final exam. But they were chemistry students who had an A, so they were nothing if not intuitive, if not inspirational. So they went to the professor and they said, last night while studying for your exam, we got a call from a friend of ours saying that he had been taken ill and he was in the hospital. And so we decided that it was much better, much more of a priority to go see a friend in the hospital than it was to study for our final exam. And our friend was away when he got sick, so the hospital wasn't the one in town. It was the one far away. And we stayed with him till the small hours of the morning. And as we drove back into town, we got a flat tire. And so by the time we called the tow truck, oh, and by the way, as these stories would go, there was no jack in the trunk of the car. So we had to call a tow truck. And by the time we called the tow truck, waited for the man, waited for him to change the flat tire and get back to campus and get changed and ready, we had missed our exam. But we're, we're A students and we studied. Is there any way we could take the exam after lunch? Well, the professor thought about this. And since they had just gotten back into town, they wouldn't have had time to talk to any other students. So he says, yeah, you can take the exam after lunch. So they ate lunch. They went to the professor's office. He put them in separate rooms and he administered the final exam. So they looked at the test and it said, page one, question one worth five points. And this was a very basic intro to chemistry question. And the boys smiled in their separate rooms because they knew that this was gonna work out fine. And they turned the page and it said page two, question two, worth 95 of your 100 points, which tire went flat. <laughs> we need to remember that God makes us good. And there is evil that is intricately woven into the good at all times. But we are ch children of God. So at all times, in all times, and for all reasons, we are to see good, we are to be good, and we are to do good things now and always. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we have the courage to live in your world and be your children in all that we do now and always. Amen.